Well, good evening and welcome to Clark University for tonight's Reflections with Norm. I'm Tom Chesney, Clark's 16th president, and we are pleased to have over 160 of you joining us live tonight. And if it's like our other events that we've had earlier this year, we can expect to have hundreds more who will be streaming this uh, long after our evening concludes. Dr. Norm Freud is retiring after 40 years on the faculty of Clark University. He joins me to my left. This is going to be his show. We're going to focus in on looking at some of the history and heritage of Mary Frances Hall. We'll have a video, a very special video coming up, but Norm, maybe set it up for us a little bit. Tell us what we're in for. Share one of the memories that you want to unwind for us before we hear others. Okay, well, there are so many um, generations of students that have gone through this dormitory and spent their key college years in life here, uh, learning at Clark. And over the time, there have been many wonderful events and many transformations in this building as well. It's kind of the mainstay or the foundation of so many different generations because the building has been here almost 100 years now. One of the things uh, I enjoy having had a chance to preview uh, the video, as you said, from above, it looks like a bird in flight. Yes. In some way, it's a bird that's taken flight many times, many, mm -hmm. many iterations. Mm -hmm. Indeed. In your 40 years with us, you've been uh, teaching throughout the generation. So many students have shared their reflections, the favorite memories they have for you. Take a moment before we focus on our topic tonight, maybe just share a little bit about some of your your favorite takeaways from getting to teach the students and work with the sisters other faculty at Clark? Well, that's a great question to ask, Tom. I would say that my number one driving force coming here was I wanted to teach. I had a burning desire to teach and felt that I was born to be a teacher. And this place has always welcomed and encouraged and expected excellence in teaching. And I've had so many good students over the years, whether they were minors or majors in my program or whether they were completing their liberal arts requirements for graduation. So many wonderful stories, so many wonderful people uh, over, over uh, the time that I've been here. I've told many people in the couple of months since I retired that I've lived the dream. My dream was to be a philosophy professor at a Catholic liberal arts university. And I've been able to do that for the last 40 years. So I really feel blessed. Our students, our university, our college at one time are all the better for it. Many of you are tuning in tonight. I know we'll have questions, thoughts, comments you wanna share for Norm directly. You may have tuned in in particular because Mary Frances Hall has some really strong yeah. memories for you as well. The chat is open for you to go in and start sharing those as we share this video with you. If you've got questions, comments, stories, we want to hear those from you because we collect those and include that in the ongoing heritage, history, and legacy that is Clark College and now Clark University. Now enjoy this video with your host, Norm, then we'll come back for some Q&A from you, and we'll continue the discussion. You really can't talk about Mary Frances Hall and all the legends and history that's involved with that building without considering who it was named for first. It was named for our foundress, Mary Frances Clark. She and her young companions, all in their 20s, came to this country in 1833, and they were inspired by our core values of freedom, education, charity, and justice. This statue of Mary Frances Clark is one of my favorite statues of all time because it portrays her as she actually dressed in her lifetime. She wore the garb of a pioneer woman. She never considered herself superior to other people, and the habit put her ahead of other people 
in the hierarchy of the church in the 1800s. So here she is in this beautiful statue in her pioneer garb. We have this statue thanks to our sesquicentennial celebration, 150 years in 1993. The late Doug Sleezer of the art department was commissioned to construct it. It is surrounded by pillars saved from our Sacred Heart Chapel, which burned in the 1984 fire. And Sister Carmel Zerden, BVM, also the art department, formed the panels that show the older buildings that formerly stood on this side of the campus. Now let's cross the street to the building itself. Now I'm standing in front of Mary Frances Hall. It actually was not the original Mary Frances Hall on this campus. An old multi-personal use building across the street had been converted into a dormitory in 1915 and served as one for nine years. But then it was converted to our first original science building. Older alums will remember that as old CBH. This building was required because of the growth in the student numbers by the 1920s. If there was one decade where the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary took more risks to build than any other, it was the 1920s, especially if you adjust for inflation. They crossed the street here at Clark in that decade, built this building. Five years later, they built to the west of it Terrence Donahue Hall. In Chicago, they built the Immaculata High School. They expanded St. Mary High School. And at the end of that decade, they built the Skyscraper College, Mundelein College on the north side of Chicago. And then the Great Depression came. Only through the efforts of financial commitment to not overspending and safeguarding all the institutions and missions that they built were they able to carry on successfully. It was in June of 1923 that groundbreaking occurred here. They positioned the entranceway directly across the street from the entrance to the original building, Margaret Mann Hall. And there was much fanfare and groundbreaking that June. The Archbishop spoke the head of the BVM congregation was here and participated. The president of our college at the time, Gervais Tuffy BVM spoke, and there was much singing and instrumentation on the part of the students. Its formal name is Mother Mary Frances Clark Residence Hall, named in honor of our foundress. It was designed by Francis Berry Byrne, who was a protege of Frank Lloyd Wright. And he had this prairie home style with simplistic functional beauty. And to save a penny, the BVMs employed the same architect to build the Immaculata in Chicago. It consists of a central portion and two wings at an angle. From above, it looks like a bird in flight. And it has five total levels from bottom to top. Above the entrance to Mary Fran Hall and behind and above me is the Latin phrase, Secut Lilium Interspinus. This is a BVM motto and translates to like a lily among the thorns. The lily is a reference to Mary, the mother of God, thorns to the sins of the world, and is thus a reference to Mary having conquest over sin. On the day of groundbreaking here in 1923, that June, a papal delegate was also here. That papal delegate and the archbishop in the groundbreaking planted two blue spruce trees on either side of what will become the sidewalk entrance to the front of the building. One of those trees survived into the 1990s when a windstorm took it. That year, when the class of 1997 graduated, they wanted to commemorate those trees that had originally been here that were blue spruces 
by planting one of their own. This is the class tree of the class of 1997. They had a little fun though. They planted a miniature, not a full-size tree, but they gave it a huge name. They called it Elephant. Welcome to the cloister wing of Mary Frances Hall. This wing used to have student dormitory rooms on it until it was renovated at the turn of the century. We preserved many of the things lost from the 84 fire, including much of the stained glass from the original building, Margaret Mann Hall. And this can be seen along this cloister hall area. If you look at this particular window here, you'll see a repeat of a lily flower, which is a symbol of the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary and that repeats itself in most of the stained glass windows. In a building that is approaching 100 years of age, such as Mary Frances Hall, over generations, different space has become different things. That is certainly true of this lower level of Mary Frances Hall. To my left, you see a fireplace. It was an original wood-burning fireplace, one of four that existed in this building. Before this space was subdivided into offices at the turn of the last century, it was an open area from this fireplace to a matching fireplace on the other side of a very large room. This room was the dining room for all the college women that lived in the building, and there was an adjoining kitchen. Across the street, the academy was still going strong as well when this building opened, and they had a dining room there underneath the Sacred Heart Chapel. By the 1930s, however, it had become too expensive with the Great Depression to operate two kitchens and two dining rooms. So to consolidate money, all the students moved to this particular building, and that space was used just here on this side of the street for a dining room. By the time the Depression was over, the dining room moved back across the street. This area became, in the 1940s, an assembly room or an activities room uh, for general student use. In 1979, it was converted into a student union and served in that capacity for 20 years until the Student Activities Center was built. And then it became subdivided into individualized office spaces. Third floor in Mary Fran was also a space that changed somewhat significantly over the years. There's a large room facing the back campus on third floor. Originally, it was built as a study hall for women who were juniors and seniors in the college. We often think today of study halls as a high school thing. But Sister Sarah McGelp and BVM could tell you that there were mandatory study halls on this campus into the 1950s. That study hall during the Great Depression, again in an attempt to consolidate resources, was used in 1933 by the Drama Department as a place to conduct dramatic literature and performances. The very next year, and then this would be true for 60 additional years, it was converted into a chapel. At one time, all the dormitories on this campus had chapels, primarily for the use of the sisters, but secondarily for the use of the students in the building as well. There was a sister who served at this institution and taught in the French department named Sister Constantia Fox. Connie, for those of us who knew her well. She was still here, living on this campus in full habit when I joined this community in 1981. She utilizes space for a chapel as an overflow space for sisters to go to when sitting tightly together in the summer for prayers in their surge habits was too hot. And there's an interesting story about how the different parts of that chapel, such as the tabernacle, uh, were arrived at. Connie had a sister who had been married for 15 years and was childless. And she and her husband donated money 
to form the altar by the tabernacle and set up the structures for the chapel. Shortly thereafter, she became pregnant. Sister Connie told her this, you have built and bought a house for God's son, and now God has sent a son to your house. That first child was a boy. They had four more children and many more grandchildren after that. That chapel would serve as such from 1934 until its closure in the 1990s when it was transformed into a lounge space on that particular floor. Today it is used as storage space, as a trunk room for students who live here that travel from long distances and like to keep some of their property here over the summer. This is one of the preserved pews from that chapel, which was named the Chapel of Our Lady. You can find another pew preserved of this sort in Eliza Kelly Hall on the second floor and a third near the entranceway of the campus store. Third floor in this building also originally had an infirmary, two rooms for six students plus an adjoining bathroom. It was on the third floor facing the front at the far east end of the building. There's a reason it was on the third floor. Students really didn't reside on the fourth floor except in one huge dormitory space. So they were looking for space for six students to be able to stay somewhere else in the building. They wanted, however, to put the infirmary as high in the building as they could possibly do. For this reason, through the 1920s, there was still a theory that germs would rise. So you should put sick people as high in a building as you could to keep the people below safe and sound. For that reason, when Mount Carmel was built in town as well, the infirmary was put on the top floor. One of the great legends of this building is the underground tunnel. The sisters always built their buildings connecting to each other. Didn't have to go outside, therefore, to go from one building to another. But when they crossed the street, they created a problem. Solution, an underground tunnel a tunnel that was used by both the sisters and the students until it was closed in 1979. If you follow me now, you can see where that tunnel entrance still is. Today, the entrance of the tunnel is in a Xerox room. And who would guess that behind that door is the famous tunnel? Now a tunnel to nowhere, because before it went to the lower levels of Margaret Mann Hall across the street. After the 1984 fire, the tunnel remained, but when they put the new buildings in, all the heating ducts on the other side are now buried underground. Let's do a little bit of exploring. There's lots of lore about this tunnel, but the first thing to know if you never use the tunnel is there's nothing aesthetically appealing about it. It was a functional space to walk from one building to the other in the dead of winter or the heat of summer without ever going outside. Let's walk a little bit further and go down a little bit further and see what we see. We're now at the low point of the tunnel. Water seeps through the
There's lots of lore about this tunnel. But the first thing to know if you never use the tunnel is there's nothing aesthetically appealing about it. It was a functional space to walk from one building to the other in the dead of winter or the heat of summer without ever going outside. Let's walk a little bit further and go down a little bit further and see what we see. We're now at the low point of the tunnel. Water seeps through these concrete walls. Water always runs downhill. So if you look to my left, you can see there's about two feet of water here at the low point of the tunnel. We are not gonna walk the plank <laughs> to go to the other side. But if we did, it continues then in an upward motion till you get to the point where Margaret Mann Hall had been. And then it's just a blank wall as the heating pipes from that point on are buried. Just above that point at the blank wall is the statue of Mary Frances Clark. Here's a little interesting story about me. The year of the fire, I thought I wanted to explore this tunnel. It still existed but wasn't used. So I went into the basement of Margaret Mann Hall, found the entrance to the tunnel from that site, but discovered they had disconnected the electrical lights to discourage anybody from entering. So I very gingerly started to walk down that tunnel and I could tell I was descending and getting lower and lower. And then my feet started to splash in water. And I said, I'll come back another day with a flashlight and explore it then. Two weeks later was the fire that destroyed that building. Welcome to fourth floor, Mary Fran. There are lots of spooky stories and legends about this top floor of this building. Many people don't realize that true dormitory living is not having a private or a semi-private room. It's being in one large room with many other individuals. The only space for student residents to live on the fourth floor that was built into this building was two large dormitories. We stand in one now. Behind me, you see the closets that the women would have had when they moved in here into this dormitory space. In addition to these behind me, there were some other closets on the other side of this large space, seven total, which meant in this space, seven women lived with two sinks and no bath. What was the motivation to live here? It was cheaper. If you wanted to have a roommate, it was much more expensive. This floor has also long been used for Halloween Fright Night activity. So you can see to my left, die and boo, you're next. Other things written in paint on the wall for the student use of this space during holiday weekends. This small room is the only fourth floor room that faces the street. It was actually, for a period of time, the bedroom of Sister Lucilda O'Connor BVM. Lucy, as we called her, taught Spanish here for decades and then served in retirement capacity as well, contributing her services to this institution for more than 50 years. The five windows that face the front symbolize the five original BVM sisters with the central window being Mary Frances Clark. And now the infamous fourth floor Red Wing. Students across generations could get up to the fourth floor, but usually the door to Red Wing was locked. And lots of the creepy stories and legends about this space relate to the Red Wing. There's gonna be a transition of floors as we enter Red Wing. What we're standing on now is a marble floorway, which is the floorway in most of this building in the hallways, but the hardwood floors in the individual rooms. When we go into Red Wing, we have a red concrete floor. Let's see what we can find. Bright red floor. We now enter a space where the individual rooms are much smaller. 
The rooms here are much smaller, and you can see on the walls things from the Halloween Fright Night. All the rooms on this wing were intended for BVM sisters. They scrimped on space for themselves. This room has one small closet, would have a bed, maybe a desk, and a dresser, and that's all that would be in this room from that particular period of time. One of the legends or stories of Red Wing is this, that long, long ago, a sister took her own life and the blood could never be cleaned from the floor. And therefore they painted the concrete floor, this wing red to cover the blood. Well, I'm a person that likes to find facts and to see what is true. So I spent a long time in archives trying to determine if anything had happened here to a BVM sister of that sort, including through archives at Mount Carmel. I could find nothing. Then it occurred to me, go look at the original blueprints of this building from 1928. I paged through the blueprints until I got to the fourth floor. And I could see most of fourth floor still had that terrazzo marble flooring. But this section, this wing that was for sisters only, there was a notation written on the blueprints for this floor. It said this, concrete floor, red paint in bed. Red wing has been red from day one. This interesting small door at the end of fourth floor red wing was the original elevator shaft. The sisters built the building with the idea that it'd be a small elevator that could hold maybe four people. But they decided they wouldn't put it in if money was tight at the end, they would not finish it. And they never did. Through this locked door, it's straight down five stories to the basement of this building. Welcome to first floor Mary Fran Hall. We are in the magnificent drawing room of first floor. You can enter this space by coming through the front door and the foyer and then up a few steps. This fireplace to my left is immediately above the fireplace below in what had been the original dining room of this building. And at the other end of this grand drawing room is another fireplace immediately above a wood-burning fireplace below it. These fireplaces were used until the late 1950s. In 1958, there was a terrible fire at a BVM elementary school in Chicago, and many children and some BVM teachers died in that fire. Thereafter, the use of wood-burning fireplaces ended on this campus. Adjoining this beautiful space is a solarium, an elevated level with windows on three sides which was a glorious place for sunning yourself, especially during winter days. One more story and legend about this building that I'd like to share with you, and I have to be honest, I'm going to debunk a certain myth here. It's been said by many generations of Clark students that the ghost of Mary Frances Clark resides in this space. I've done a lot of research on Mary Frances Clark, I don't think she would haunt anybody. She's not that kind of person. But many years ago, Sister Francine Gould, BVM, told me this story. She's a graduate of this institution from the 1920s, which meant she was one of the first women to live in this dormitory when it opened. She also was proud of the fact she was the very first student who was permitted to have an automobile on the campus. Years later, she returned to this institution to serve here and to minister here. One of her jobs was to turn off all of the bell systems in this building for holidays so that they wouldn't ring to get students up to go to classes. Late one night, she realized that she had not turned off the bell system and she was out of her habit and ready for bed. Now remember, at that time of history, 
a BVM sister could not be seen at all in public not wearing the hat. She had, however, the cloak assigned her uh, for winter use, which was long and dark and had a hood. So she thought, it's the middle of the night. Nobody will be up anyway. I'll just wear my cloak. And she was shutting off the systems of the various clocks in the building. When a student got up to go to the bathroom, saw her at the dark end of the hallway at the other end, and said, Sister, is that you? Sister Francine shared with me, what could I do? I couldn't say yes, because I was out of my habit. So she said, I just slowly turned my back toward her and quietly walked away in the darkness. That was in the 1940s. And you can see how long that story has passed down over the years. Sister Francine had a couple of other good ones that I'll share with you before concluding this segment of things. She was assigned to the registrar's office in 1952 when the BVM who had that job suddenly left. She didn't know what to do. She had no idea about what to do. And the superior here told her, just tell the students you're busy, write down what they want, and then later in the evening you can figure out how to do it. And you only have to do it for a day or two anyway. She was registrar for 20 years from 1952 until 1972 when Sister Eugenia Sullivan BVM took over that particular function. The other thing, the first day she was here, when she was assigned here in the fall of 1946, she caught a co-ed sliding down one of the banisters in this building. She stared at her. She didn't know how lenient things might have become but she thought that wasn't appropriate. She stared at that freshman student. That student who said, did you see how that sister stared at me? Was Therese Mackin, class of 1950 and future PVM. Welcome to the solarium space of Mary Fran Hall. This glorious building has been the home of five generations of Clark students from its origin in 1924. That first generation of students was all born at the beginning of the 20th century. Current students that reside here were born at the beginning of the 21st century. The first three generations were all women. The last two generations include men and women. Let me tell you one story of one graduate from that first generation. Her name was Marie Phelan. She was the class of 1924. So she saw this building being completed at the juncture of her graduation from this institution. She was from Galesburg, Illinois. She became a high school teacher in the field of psychology in the 1920s in the state of California after graduating from here. An extraordinary story of the remarkable things our graduates were able to do, and a woman being able to teach high school psychology back then would be very uncommon. She felt called, though, and urged to join religious life. So after less than a decade of teaching, she joined the Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Marie Phelan was given a religious name when she did that, and she was given the name Mary Benedict. She would go on to become the president of this institution from 1957 to 1969. She would take us into the modern era, secure federal funding for new buildings, create a lay board of trustees, and the magnificent new dormitory then called West Hall that was built during her time here as president later was named in her honor, Mary Benedict Hall. The site on which this magnificent building is built was historically called the Sunset Campus at Clark because the sun sets on the side of the campus. When this building was constructed, a statue of Mary was placed 
beneath me and below of this building and was named Our Lady of the Sunset. And generations of Clark students during May crowning gathered around that statue for that particular activity. And the class of 1952 planted their twin evergreen trees on either side of that statue that still remains. Well, welcome back. Norm, I've got to hand it to you. <laughs> Compressed a lot of storytelling, history, and lore into a wonderful 30-minute video. I, I hope you're encouraged to come back and view it again and again. You may have noticed, as we sit here in Mary Frances Hall, we even had one of those <laughs> moments where it felt like the ghosts were with us. <laughs> but we came right through that, and we hope you enjoyed it very much. This is a time for you to continue to put your comments, your stories into the chat, and your questions for Norm. I'm getting cards handed to me with those already. I want to start, though, with a reflection. Sister Therese Mackin was uh, noted in the video, mm -hmm. and I know you know her well. Uh, she died just within the last few days here at, at Clark. Uh, long after the video had been prepared, share a reflection and some of your, your memories of her, if you would. Therese was just a magnificent giant among the leaders uh, throughout our history here at this institution. Like many BBMs of her era, she was a workaholic, and she was also contagious. So she could get a hold of you by the elbow, and you would be doing a job, and you'd be doing it well. If, if Therese uh, thought of a way that you could help this institution. And one quick story that I think the class of 1971 will appreciate, they'll be celebrating their golden anniversary of graduation this fall. Every class named a tree, and they picked as the name of their tree, son of a bush. <laughs> now, Therese at the time was dean of students. And to her credit, she did not tell the students they could not name their tree son of a bush. But she said, I get to set the stage and the tenor for what that means in my talk, and then the tributes to the tree should follow that. And what Therese said was this, we are all part of a great Christian tradition that goes back to our Jewish roots in the Old Testament, all the way back to the burning bush oh. in the desert. And we are all daughters and sons of that bush. And then that sent the stage for the tributes to that tree. That sounds like quintessential Therese from what I've, in, I've learned in, in my short time here. Thank you, Norm. I'm sure you have many memories. What's one of your own personal favorite memories of Mary Frances Hall? Well, first of all, the space where we're sitting is very special to me because this was one of the original wood-burning fireplaces, but in 2001, I was on team to go to uh, uh, Appalachia with Clark students and staff uh, for a week-long service trip, and we had many meetings of planning in this particular room. This space was also previously part of the student union that was here when I came in 1981. And I have a story I'd like to share about the Quito Carnival. Um, many students may know, but others may not know, that the BVMs for a long time had a mission in Quito called the Working Boys Center. And Sister Catherine Ann Beckman, BVM, was tireless in her effort to create fundraising opportunities for that mission. And for many years we had in this space, when it was a union, a Quito Carnival. There would be auctions, there would be items for sale, there would be different musical presentations or skits that were done. And one time at the Keto Carnival, uh, I was attending and there was a Tully bear that was being auctioned off, which was a bear with all sorts of stories about 
who its parents were, where it had visited, what countries it had been to. And the bear gets held up and, and the auctioneer says, who wants this bear? And suddenly everybody is kind of smiling and laughing and pointing in my direction. Besides me, he had climbed up on the back of the banister, was my three-year-old son, Gabe, and he had his <laughs> hand up like this. So I said, I got to buy this bear. And I had bid for it. I had to bid a couple of times because other uh, families, uh, parents were, were bidding for it. And then I thought I had it. And all of a sudden, I'm outbid by Sister Marguerite Newman, BVM. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, why does Sister Marguerite want a bear? So I outbid her. And she outbid me again. <laughs> and then, of course, it's dawning on me. She's up in the price to help the keto mission. She does not want this bear. So she raised me a third time. And then I looked at her and I said, Marguerite, if you raise a fourth time, it's your bear. And she didn't raise. I got the bear. My son, as he grew up, took that bear on all sorts of trips. And now his daughter, Hadley, my granddaughter, takes the bear on her trips, too. Oh, my gosh. And, that, that's, a, and that's a picture we're going to need for the archives as well. Great, great story. Thank you, Norm. One of our um, viewers tonight asks or, for you to... Talk about one of the most infamous ghost stories related to Mary Frances Hall. Can you choose just one? Well, you know, there are lots of different stories, and I don't know if this one is infamous or not. But Kevin Perhatch, who graduated, I'm guessing maybe 15, 16 years ago uh, from Clark, uh, he lived in this dormitory, and he was insistent that he would have water glasses that he put by his bed stand at night, and in the morning they'd be empty, and he hadn't drunk the water, and that it had to be the ghost of Mary Frances Clark. And I always thought about that and thought about telling him, you know, probably if you were thirsty in the middle of the night, you might have drunk the water and not remembered that you drank the water, rather than thinking the ghost of Mary Frances Clark was thirsty. I did have a double take, though, when I found out that his room used to be part of that third floor chapel. They had converted some of that chapel space into rooms. I think his room was over what used to be the altar in the chapel. Ooh. Room over the altar. That sounds like a chapter <laughs> in a book. We've got another question that's come in, tunnel related. Yes. Whatever happened to the swimming pool? that connected to the tunnel. Okay, so the swimming pool was part of Terrence Donahue Hall, which was originally built as an auditorium and recreation building. It was beneath the uh, gymnasium that was built in that building. And the swimming pool was used for a very, very long time period of time. But remember, it was very, very old by the time we get into the 21st century. And one time when they flushed the system out to refill, the piping mechanism was just not effective to, to put money into repair anymore. So the pool is actually there mm -hmm. still. It is filled with sand. And now the floor above it is the Nicholas Fitness Center. So if you go into that fitness center and you wonder, why are all these lobsters and seashells painted on a wall that has kind of the green of the ocean? It's because that was the pool room. Here's another question. Is there any significance to the rooms in the stairwell of Mary Fran? When first built, were they used for someone in particular? I'm not sure which rooms those are a reference to. Built in the stairwell, uh, whether it's just at the landing of the stairwell, I'm not sure about that. So I, I don't really know how to answer that because I'm not sure what particular rooms that would be a reference to. And maybe if that viewer is still watching, they can yes, particularize they they that. Could. We've maybe got a moment to clarify. I might be able to still put answer, or <clears throat> clarify that in the chat. <clears throat> Uh, Karen asks the following question. Is there a staff member who still lives in Mary Frances Hall? I think I remember Sister 
Kenneth Keller living in a room to the left of the entryway. Over the years, many BVMs would have lived in that dormitory, and they would have lived in all the dormitories. If you look at our history from 1843, we started as a boarding academy. The sisters were everything. They were the mm -hmm. teachers and the administrators, sometimes both, during the day, and then they were responsible for the students who lived on site, who were the boarders, at night. So well into fairly recent times, sisters served as RAs in the dormitories, and many lived in the dormitories. When Meneve Dunham was president, it was her desire to have students monitor students in the dormitories, and it was the creation of a system where now RAs are students. So that process of the sisters living in the dormitories, as RAs especially, was being filtered out when I came in 81. There were still a few that were doing it, but I don't think any did after the fire. The fire was kind of a break to put into a different system. Uh, some of the sisters did continue to live but not be RAs in different places on campus much later. So until the mid-1990s, Letter Wing in Mary Josita Hall was retired sisters lived there. And we had formerly two White Houses, now just one that's mm -hmm. left, above the area of the soccer field. And in the larger house for a long period of time, Carol Blitchen BVM and, and, and also Carmel Zerden BVM lived there. And Sister Ramona Barwick lived in the small house. And they didn't move out of those places till this century, the 20th century. Is uh, Mary Frances Hall still popular as a residence hall? What is its current popularity? That's an interesting question. If you go through archives, when it opened, it was a brand new space exclusively for those students who were in the college as opposed to the academy. And because some of them did not have a dorm space that was just for them, they lived in the upper floors of multi-purpose older buildings, they were enthusiastic about coming over this brand new space. In 1965, when Mary Ben Hall opened, all the upper class people, well not all, but many of the upper class people in this building wanted to move over there because it was a brand new building and had all the amenities. But by the time I got here in 1981, old was cool again. Mm -hmm. And many of the upper class students wanted to be in this building, not in buildings that were no longer brand new. That's interesting to say old is cool again. I've been, been thinking about that too. Every, everyone who comes onto campus maybe does some work with our facilities team, for example, and engineers, architects, over and over again they say, you're, buildings have terrific bones, mm -hmm. great construction. Yeah. If you're going to do something new or different, mm -hmm. work around in the insides of these great buildings with their great architecture and construction. And that rings very true throughout the generations that they've been here. I've got a question from Liz Petty. How many people lived in Mary Fran at full capacity? About how many live there now? We're really testing your stats. Yes. Um, I do not know the answer to either of those questions. Uh, but one of the key developments that occurred with us when the pandemic struck is we went to single spacing in each dormitory room with a single student in a room and not two uh, in, in a room. Uh, we have always had the capacity, if we needed to, to expand a fourth floor into some of that space that was supposedly haunted and other space up there to transform it into more and additional space. So I don't know when the zenith would have been. It might have been when everyone was housed here uh, in the late 30s, early 40s, or it might have been more nearly in the 1960s when we hit an enrollment peak. I think with some of that allure of the history and our uh, growing enrollment, we're seeing really striking near record yeah, numbers yeah, yeah, for yeah. this fall. That could be a resurgence back into those spaces as well. <clears throat> kind of related to that, 
Have the rooms on the top floor ever been used for purposes other than haunted houses? When did the haunted houses stop? I don't know for sure when they stopped, but they were hugely popular in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, when I was first here. And they used openings into the attic to reach down to grab at people. They had a strobe light system in a rather darkened area of that floor. They used lining of black to make you kind of go through tunnels and find different places. So for a long period of time, it was a big and popular thing on this campus. Student space up there would have been in those large rooms that were the dormitories. And again, a real dormitory is a large room with many, many individuals that sleep and live in it. Uh, what we're accustomed today to call a dormitory is a private or a semi-private room where there's two or one people in it. <clears throat> Quick follow-up on the haunted houses. Was that competitive or comparative year over year or class to class? Were they trying to outdo themselves at times or is it? That's a good question. And again, I'm not know. sure what the answer to that one was. I never, see if I would go to that, that fright night, I would have taken my children and most of them at the time were too young. I didn't want it quite. <laughs> Although I think some years they might have done a light fright one night and a more frightening fright another <laughs> night. We have a follow-up on yes. the stairwell yes, question. Yes, yes. So it says, yes, these are the rooms that were right at the top of the stairwell. And then the doors to the dormitory halls went off that little stairwell space. They were single rooms. Does that help? Um, it helps a little, but there are three stairwells in the building and two originally. So if it was the end stairwell, most of those would have been rooms. But okay. if it was at the very top floor of the easternmost stairwell, that's Red Wing. And that would have been rooms where sisters originally were designed to live in residence. Uh, at the other end, it might well have been student rooms there. And there was that infirmatory that was infirmary that was on the um, uh, second floor as well. By the way, an interesting aside, Tom. On campus students, the original name for them is inmates. <laughs> They live within the institution. Sure. And if you go to our archives, especially from the late 19th century, they talk about all the inmates are happy at uh, Mount St. Joseph. <laughs> and they all read The Prisoner at some point <laughs> during their literary <laughs> undertakings at Clark. Uh, we had another question. So who served the longest at Clark University? Ah, uh, well, let's start with top leadership, the longest serving uh, individual in the presidency was Sister Catherine Dunn uh, at over 22 years. And second was the niece of Mary Frances Clark, Josephine Clark. All of those years were in the 1800s. And the third longest was Gertrude Reagan. But you have to go back to when we were on the prairie uh, to get to get her into the mix. Now, if we go beyond that title role, who served the longest of anybody at this institution? Four sisters did serve here 60 or 61 wow. years. Uh, St. Kevin Foley was the first. She left in 1955, so she started here in 1894. And Therese Mackin knew her from her student days and said she was renowned and famous for the dandelion wine she made. She worked on grounds crews here. St. Clara Sullivan, also 61 years, famous for the Kitchen of Tomorrow and the Home Act Department, and uh, the show she did mm -hmm. on, on a regular basis on radio uh, for that program. Rachel Apple, who served in the post office and was known as Sister Mary Post Office, 61 years. And the fourth and final one to serve that long was Ramona Barwick, BVM, 
who is happily living in retirement mm -hmm. now and serves 61 years and a few additional months. No one that I found in archives has served this institution longer than Sister Ramona. Wow. Over nearly 250 years across oh, yeah, the four of them. Yeah. A couple more questions from our viewers. We still have some time for those. <clears throat> Love these. Does Mary Fran still have a nurse living on site? We have a, a office for the nurse on campus, which is in the lower level of Mary Jacinta Hall. Many of the student services were put over in that space during renovation two, three, four years ago. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not a nurse that lives on site in a particular dormitory. The fun fact would be, for the, the last two years, my only two years here, the director of the nursing program lived in the remaining White House. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> but I don't think that counts within the scope of the question that we have. Here's another question. Do you envision that Mary Fran will be able to continue to be maintained so it can house students for decades to come? I would say absolutely to yeah. that answer. Uh, the big change that was most necessary occurred in 2002. The windows in this building, over 400 of them, were all the original wood frame windows. And at 79 years of age, they needed to be replaced. And this building and the era in which it was built, they didn't have all the same size windows, so they had to be custom made. In terms of the foundation of this building, the quality of, of how it was built, this building easily is here many, many, many more generations beyond 100 years, and it'll hit 100 years in two years. Yeah, the, the students and others have asked about that, and the resounding answer has been throughout. As we're looking at those mm -hmm. designs and, and you know, the residence halls for the students of today uh, have some changes to them, and always the answer comes back. Absolutely, we'll do it within mm -hmm. those, th those spaces, which will be a great preservation of that history as well. Did Sister Ramona work in the bookstore? Sister Ramona worked in the bookstore and in the post office. When she first started here, she was one of the Sisters Stellan food wow. service. If you go back far enough in our history, there was a one-third, two-thirds division among BVMs on this campus. One third worked in support services of some sort, including in food service and grounds work, and two thirds were teachers and administrators. So when she first came here, she was in food service. Then the sister who was in charge of the bookstore had a stroke, and she took over that responsibility. And that responsibility bled into being responsible for the post office as well. Our bookstore, our post office, historically, have been side by side. So, but a, a question related to those working relationships, and I guess it's, maybe it's partly the culture and values of, of, of Clark. My sense has been, since I first stepped foot on campus, mm -hmm. but like the BVMs that you've t talked about, who all together were all in for the academy, for the yeah. college, for the university. Whatever had to get done, got yeah. done. It seems like that legacy lives on, even if there are declining numbers of them directly on campus or part of the work that happens here. Yes. Would you speak to that? Many of the employees of this institution, beyond those that are BBMs, have worked here for decades. Uh, I am proud of the fact that I have now become the fourth non-BVM to serve 40 or more years at this institution. Uh, 40 for us is like 60, though, <laughs> for the BVMs in terms of the numbers that are there. Clark is a strong community, dedicated to learning, based in the values of freedom, education, charity, and justice and generation after generation that has resonated with students. And I have taught a couple of those generations with great pride and honor. Thanks, Storm. I'm gonna ask you to <clears throat> I'm gonna wrap it up one more 
more question. Um, you put a lot into 30 minutes in, in putting together this video, and we're reminded of the uh, video that we also have, and I would encourage others to look at with the legacy of trees on campus yes. as well. What's, I don't think anything literally fell onto the cutting room floor in the editing room, but what's a piece of the history of Mary France, <clears throat> uh, Mary Frances Hall that didn't get into it, maybe you haven't shared tonight, that you could well, I don't know. one of the very interesting things and I think wonderful things that happened with this very old building is that when the newer buildings were built, uh, where the Cloister uh, Walk used to be, the Keel Center, and then the Student Activity Center, they did a wonderful job of leading the old and the new together so that it was like a seamless garment. So this space in what we are s seated now was very, very different a generation ago and even more so before then. Buildings that last a long time, they have different epics and eras and ways to serve. And this building continues to serve. Mm -hmm. Up above as a dormitory. Down below, all sorts of different offices, student services, things of that sort. What's your wish for this building and its next generation and those that follow? Oh, I hope there continue to be many generations of students that live and make wonderful memories and great friendships in this space. And I hope it will see a longevity that the buildings that were here when I came would have seen if not for that fire. Well, <clears throat> Professor Norm Freund, Norm as we know him because we are a First Name University. Um, thank you so much for this evening's event, for everything that you've given and your service to the university uh, as well. Thank you all for joining us uh, this evening. If you're watching live, uh, we're grateful for you for that. If you're watching at another time, you want to reach out, got a question, we know how to reach him. <laughs> and we'll probably get that question to him because he'll be the best one to know. We have some other great events coming up soon. We want to remind everyone, uh, Homecoming on September 24th to 26th is going to be the homecoming of homecomings. We'll have the classes of uh, 1970 and 1971 celebrating their 50th anniversaries and really opening the, the doors, the buildings, and, and, the, and the campus back to full swing having come through this pandemic of the last year. We hope you'll join us for that. And if you can't, we hope you'll take a look at the other activities we have uh, throughout the year as we continue to stream events live, share things with our, our alumni and friends. We'd love to have you be a part of that. And if you have ideas about what we can do better, how we can uh, share and teach and learn together, we hope you'll do that with us too. For now, it's good night from Clark University, from hallowed Mary Frances Hall. Who knows where our journeys will take us next and who knows who might take us there. Norm, thank you. Thank you.